Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. I am really excited to introduce my friend Julio Rosas, also my, you know, my, my, my colleague at Town Hall, the author of the new book. And Julio, I got to tell you, your title is one of those words that I just trip over every time. How do you pronounce the title of your book? Fiery. Fiery, okay. So I've heard, how else would, how else would you pronounce it? I've heard fury. And I was thinking fury. that can't be right. That can't be right. It's gotta be fiery, right? But that's yeah. just one of those words. <laughs> fiery but mostly peaceful. Yes, that's the title of the book. Fiery but mostly peaceful. And Julio, of course. Um, we actually had um suspected that Julio was um a carrier for riots across America because wherever <laughs> a riot would pop up, there would be Julio doing some great reporting from the scene. Starting off, uh, I should add, in what was formerly my town, uh, the Twin Cities, uh, during the uh, Minneapolis George Floyd riots, which I think was it's the start of your book, and I think it's really the start of your reporting, right, on urban unrest in America. Yeah, that, I mean, that was the first actual riot that I ever covered in, in, in my career. I covered Charlottesville in 2017. I covered some like Proud Boy, Antifa, brawls in Portland in 2019. But as big and as chaotic as those were, they were not riots. It didn't reach that level because riots, in my opinion, uh, has to do more, much more lawlessness, looting, the fires, you know, cops being attacked, kind of more, more along those lines. And so Minneapolis was, was the first one. And so uh, I remember just even the night before my flight, I couldn't sleep just because I was so, I was, I was nervous, I was anxious, I was excited because I was seeing the, the videos that were coming out of there. And you know, buildings were on fire and things were just, just so out of control. And I, and I just realized that this was not gonna be anything like I had ever covered before. And so, uh, and, and so my initial thought was, okay, this is going to be hectic for a few days, but eventually, at some point, order will be restored, hopefully. And then I'll just leave, and then that'll be the end of that. But they, as time went on, things kept happening, and, and, and things continued to get out of control in different parts of the country. And I just continued just going from place to place whenever, whenever it made sense. And... August rolls around and, and, and I was just thinking, are these things ever going to stop? Yeah. And and then then Kenosha happened and I'm just thinking, okay, well, <laughs> we're, we're 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 screwed as a country, I guess. I guess yes. And so, yeah, Minneapolis uh, to date has been the worst riot that I ever covered in terms of scale, damage, personal danger, because that's where I got shot with a rubber bullet by the state police. Yes, uh, yeah, great, uh, great and, passage and, and, in the book about that, it, by the way. And th 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 <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, the only major injury I, I sustained during that entire year, which is actually pretty amazing, considering uh, some of the places I, I did go to and what was I confronted with, but. Uh, yeah, Minneapolis uh, today it's been was was the worst. Yeah, yeah, you know, and and like I said, I was there, right? I was still living there um, in 2020. This is a couple of years ago. I didn't move out until uh, the uh, end of June of 2021. So I was sticking, you know, I was around there for the aftermath as well, and uh, the the you know defund the the aftermath in terms of defunding the police and what impact that had on the twin cities it's all incredibly corrosive and and julio i mean i wasn't in the middle of the la riots i actually was in the middle of moving out of los angeles when the la riots broke out in 1992 yeah but i mean it, the same mistakes were made by the local police in the twin cities as was made in los angeles which was that the police retreated rather than getting more personnel out on the streets, rather than maintaining that presence and containing the the disorder, right? In in 1982, the police yeah, did the yeah. exact same thing. They abandoned they abandoned the streets and um, allowed it to just completely metastasize. Uh, uh, they, 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 yeah, they, they pulled out of Florence and Normandy, which is in, yep. South, in South Los Angeles, and that's that was the epicenter of everything. And they very much took that approach to the rest of the city. And so with Minneapolis, it was very much the same way, although a little bit different because in this case, the the, 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 the hot spot, the main con area of conflict was outside the third precinct. And right. so the, the cops didn't necessarily pull out. They, the cops that were stationed there, they couldn't leave because if they did leave, they would have burned down the precinct, which they eventually did. But, but up until that point, 
uh, the rioters. But up until that point, they were still trying to maintain as marginal as it was, it was still they were trying to maintain some level of presence, even though they were technically confined because there, there were just masses of people outside every single day. And then as it turned into night, they would riot the, 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 the protesters. And so it, it was but there no, there are definitely a lot of similarities. And another another example is how you know, in, in Los Angeles in 92, there wasn't enough ammunition for the National Guard. Right. They, and so they were waiting for that. They're waiting for that. They could, couldn't have a full combat. Load. And so eventually the, 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 the governor had to order the National Guard out into the streets with not enough ammunition to, to, to be what would be considered to be a full combat load. And with Minneapolis, we have since found out that the mayor, the mayor's office and the governor's office, apparently just they, there was a breakdown in communication and they didn't follow the quote unquote proper procedure to request the national guard to be activated. And so that added, you know, extra time that the city did not have. Right. And so the, so George Floyd was killed on Sunday. The riots broke out immediately on Monday because the video went viral on Monday, Monday morning. And I did not see the national guard out until Friday. So, I mean, that is, that's a work week essentially. Right. And the, the, and there wasn't even, especially by the area of, of the third precinct, there were, there was no even state cops. There was no other, other police forces that could have come in from the outside. So I don't know what their plan was during that time. Now, the next morning after the officers were to evacuate and riders broke into their precinct, set things on fire. Then the next morning, that's when we saw the national guard, the state troopers. Um, so it, it was just such a, it was just such a, abdication or just incompetence yep. on the city and the state leaders fault. Yeah. Now at the same time, you also can't really fault them for that to a point because up until that there was Ferguson, but Ferguson was a relatively, I say, I say relatively, you know, relatively small in, in quotes, but compared to what happened in Minneapolis right. and to the city, cities, you know, there was Ferguson, but that was back in 2014. And so really the, the last large major riot was Los Angeles in 92. And so what, what we've seen is this, that when there is these updates to riot control and procedures, it, it takes decades then for the next one to happen. And by then people leave, plans change, things get outdated. And so it's like we're just constantly caught flat footed with this. And it feels like it shouldn't happen this way. And that's why as the riots continued in 2020, like with Kenosha, that that was there was no excuse for how out of control that got because you they because Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers can't say oh well we we were just unprepared it's like you literally your ne your state next door had five hundred you know had you know millions of dollars worth of damage just two months prior and there's been more riots since then so how do you like how are you still like not prepared for something like this to happen and sure maybe they weren't expecting it to happen in Kenosha but I mean you would think that the people that we pay taxes to would do, be more proactive with, with uh, uh, being prepared <laughs> right. and being in a chaotic season. But apparently right. I mean, I understand why they kind of caught Minneapolis flat footed a little bit, Minneapolis and St. Paul flat footed a little bit. <clears throat> a little bit I think yeah. by, I think by Monday it was pretty clear that you needed the national guard out in the streets. And I, you know, I, I, I get that you have to have a very particular, chain of command on those requests and and you know eyes really do need to be dotted and t's really do need to be crossed because it's a it you're can be illegal yeah, yeah, yeah you're, you're deploying, deploying troops, troops. On, on an american city right so you got to be very careful about that but there's no reason why you you have two guys who are just a few miles from each other who can't sit down in an office at some point and say somebody bring us the paperwork we're going to nail this thing down so we can get this thing done um I, you know, the, the, the disconnect between uh, 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 the, the mayor and the governor in, in Minneapolis was just, you know, oh, it was insane. very evident, very yeah, was, evident. Uh, the, I, I believe it was the Star Tribune that they, they got the, they FOIA'd the emails between the governor's office and between the mayor's office about, because that was everyone was asking, why, why did it take so long for the National Guard to come out there? And yeah, there, there was there was just a constant no. This is no. This falls under your authority. No, it doesn't. And it was just it's just bureaucracy, right? Right. And, and, and that and that's just unfortunate because 
people got hurt, people got killed, and, and people's livelihoods were, were destroyed. And as I, as, I, as I write in the book with Minneapolis, there had people had to take things into their own hands because there was, no, there was nobody. There was no one coming there to help. No one was going to save you. If you were in Minneapolis at that time and you needed help, good luck because it, it wasn't, it wasn't going to come. You know, I want to I want to get to a couple of the other um, experiences that you've had that you go through in this book. A again, fiery but mostly peaceful by Julio Rosas. It's already on sale, so go get your go get your copy now. Um, but I want to talk about the but mostly peaceful part of your title because it's not just you recounting in in really gripping detail your experiences in covering these stories, not just in the Twin Cities, but in Seattle and and Kenosha and other places. Uh, but also the media coverage and how the media reported on on these um, incidents. And, you know, the I, I believe it was MSNBC. Was it um, who was it? Was it Ali Velshi that was in doing, Minneapolis? Yeah, in Minneapolis, yep. Um, yep. where they had the Chiron that had um, oh, uh, no, mostly no, peaceful. No. no, that was CNN in Kenosha. Ali oh. Velshi. Ali Velshi and his 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 quote is the the title of the first chapter. He he as a building was burning behind him. He said what was happening was not generally speaking unruly, which was <laughs> and and I remember seeing him. I remember seeing him out when things were crazy. And by the time he made that remark, the riots had been had been restarted for like another by for like two hours. I mean, so yeah, I mean. You would think that if you know in the recounting of 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 all these rights that I covered, I wouldn't have to talk about other mainstream media's coverage of it, but I had to because their their coverage of it was atrocious. It it, it was it, it was it was partisan it, it, because they it was who they wanted to protect the narrative because of who was perpetrating these rights, right? It was right. The Black Lives Matter, Antifa. Uh, progressive racial justice equity movement. And so, therefore, we don't want to make them look bad because either a they didn't want themselves to be called racist, or b they they just were lazy, or they were just really that partisan. And and so that's and so that was another reason for the book is not just to solidify into a physical medium my experiences and experiences of other people, but also solidify the, the media's extreme malpractice during that time. And and look, obviously, the media, the mainstream media you know, mishandling and, you know, purpose, purposeful distortion of what was happening in the riots is far from the only topic where, where they do that. Uh, it's just that it, to me, it speaks to their, their, their arrogance and their, uh, their, 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 them being used to having just complete control of the narrative when they're going to gaslight the American people by say, oh yeah, this is a fiery, mostly peaceful protest when, entire neighborhoods are ablaze. I mean, right. it's just, just, just the gall that they have to, that they think they can just do that and think no one's really going to pay, like call them out on it or not, not take issue with it. I, that, that really speaks to their, their mindset. Yeah. And, and, and I would say that um, it extends to the, to the chapter that you have on Chaz too. Um, and in, in the way that they've reported on other, um, Protests and even a, even the, the the Capitol riot, which was a terrible event, and I mean, no one should be defending the January sixth riot. It was a terrible thing to do. It was a, a stupid um, rally to hold under the circumstances in the first place, um, and it got out of control, and people were assaulted, and they were trying to derail a constitutional process. Now, I don't know that I call that necessarily insurrectionist, but you can make the argument that it is, and I'm okay with people making that argument, but. We had just got through a whole year. In fact, we weren't even done with it yet because you still had some of these so-called autonomous zones, which were insurrections in the middle of city, in the middle of cities, where um, radical activists seized uh, both pers both public and private property, and declared themselves their own government in those. Now that's <laughs> that's insurrectionist period, and yet yeah. we never heard it called that. Uh, you know, it started in Seattle. It, by the way, I could say it, it may have actually started in Minneapolis because, you know, they had George Floyd Square, which was um, oh, yeah. not quite yeah. as advertised as autonomous, but s certainly in practice was was treated that way. Yep. yep. But um, but you didn't hear the 
these are insurrectionists that are that are doing that all through 2020. These these were people who were well, they're you know they're trying to establish social justice in, in these things, which is nonsense. They were hostaging the people who lived and worked in those places. Yeah, absolutely, and and that's why even even outside of the autonomous zone movement uh, that 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 happened uh, during that year. There, I mean, the the attack on the federal courthouse for an entire month in July was another good example of because the the uh, Adam Kinzinger during the one of the first the hearings of January sixth committee he he said you know let's let's talk about the definition of an insurrection and he listed out a definition which in essence was just uh, a, a, a taking taking actions against against the government well using his definition that he provided that equally applies to Antifa riders attacking a federal courthouse right. in Portland. Now, granted, obviously, a federal courthouse in, in a city is not on the same level of importance in terms of just government structure as the Capitol building. I agree with that, however, too. However, again, when we look at the perpetrators of, of, of in Portland and how many had their charges dropped, even on the D, for, like, forget the, 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 uh, the Moneta County District Attorney, who who did dismiss a lot of serious uh, cr- uh, criminal charges, but even on the D- the DOJ level, I mean the the DOJ understandably is going to crack down super hard on people who rioted and broke into the Capitol building, and and in the case that I provided, it was a guy who walked into the Senate chamber and he wasn't accused of violence, he wasn't accused of of being a rioter, he just walked in the Senate chamber, and they want and the DOJ prosecutors wanted to throw the book at at them at, at him. For just simply walking in, and 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 the prosecutor made the case that well, we want to send a message to her this and never happen again. And but then when you look at what the DOJ did in Portland and the cases that they were referred to, I mean, we're talking about assaults on federal officers with, with hammers. We're talking about assaults yep. with uh, skateboards. One person was armed with a gun at the time he assaulted a federal officer. All those cases were all those cases were, were, were dismissed. The charges were dropped. And 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 so when we talk about what justice should be, you know, equal justice under the law. There's 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 disparities, and, and that's why you see people who are so fervently defending some of the January 6th demonstrators, uh, because yeah, maybe they weren't actually violent. Maybe maybe all they did was just walk in uh, when they shouldn't have, and yet they're being labeled as domestic terrorists, while very violent people were just let off the hook because for reasons that you know, we don't even we don't even know equity maybe. But right, I, I I just I I cannot stand. When people want to say January 6th was, cause, uh, you know, I was there, I covered it, it was a riot, but they want to t- say it was a 9-11 or it was a Pearl Harbor. It, it's just, no, it wasn't. I mean, by, it's the same thing of, it's the same thing of, it's, it's the same kind of tactic of delegitimizing it or, 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 or downplaying it, downplaying a riot by overstating what actually happened, right? Right. It, 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 it's just, it's a historical, number one, to do either one of those. But it's it's just especially frustrating when when the same people do it to to different things because it just depends on well, well who rioted and for me a riot's a riot I mean that, that, and I like covering riots I don't care who's rioting I will go out and cover it uh, but it, it's it's very very aggravating to to just constantly see that well and and you cover the January sixth riot in your book it's one of the chapters that you cover so it's it's yeah. certainly part of the mix there and. Um, and and again, I think that there's, I, I think that the, this is again an issue of media malpractice and, and media bias, narr- narrative journalism uh, to yeah. promote a particular um, cause. You know, I, I'm kind of curious, are there any more of the autonomous zones still in operation? I, I, I honestly don't the, recall the only, that. Oh, go ahead. The only one that I'm aware of that's still kind of operating in any capacity is George Floyd Square. That's what I thought. Um, and even then, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's still around. I just haven't kept up to date with it. Uh, and actually, you put the idea in my head to probably follow up on that. But uh, Chaz, Chaz in Seattle, or CHOP, was done in, in about a month. There was a little bit of an autonomous zone in Atlanta shortly after I recall that. Ray, Sh- Ray Shard Brooks. Uh, but he, again, it's, it's funny, right? Because obviously, the, the very progressive activists and 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 people in seattle they were all about promoting it on social media and saying like yeah you know, they made a big deal out of it but then when you with the rayshard brooks case in atlanta 
it was smaller. It was, you know, the, 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 the occupied place was, was much smaller, but it operated the same way. Cops were constantly chased out of the area with multiple shootings. Uh, but these people were from the inner city. You know, they, they're, they're, they don't care about looking good on social media. They, they, they just wanted to do their own thing. And so that's why a lot, not a lot of people kind of realized what was happening there. I mean, because, I mean, I was there cover, covering that little area for, 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 for a couple of days. But so, yeah, to my knowledge, only George Floyd Square is, is uh, kind of the only place where, and, and we've seen the disaster results. I mean, I remember, I believe it was the one-year anniversary of George Floyd's death. And people were at that morning were at George Floyd Square to commemorate that, and there was right. a, there was a drive by shooting. I remember right. writing and, about that. And, yes. Yeah, and, and then there was, and and because there, the reason why that shooting got a lot of attention was because there's a lot of national news cameras and media things, uh, news journalists out there. So it was kind of hard to ignore that happened. <laughs> but the, but dur during especially last year, there were multiple crimes that are happening in and around the zone, but. Cops can't go there. So well, and I can tell you from from you know being there and watching local reporting on this, the local reporting on it kind of stayed up up, up and current with it. And the people who lived in that area were irate that the city would not take the barricades down, and that the city was still not um, taking control of that neighborhood because they were basically at the mercy of people who just decided to arrogate that power unto themselves. And, you know, you talk about this in, in your in your book about, you know, you are now leaving the USA, that type of thing. Those, first off, that's just by definition insurrectionist. But secondly, that's not done by some sort of, dip, or, you know, some sort of like to me, democratic formula. That's done by people who are just arrogating uh, the power of violence unto themselves and seizing territory, both public and private, for their own rule. I mean, it's it's antithetical to what we're supposed to be doing in in creating a self-governing populace. Right, and and the funny story about with Chaz, which later turned into Chop, is because I mean, clearly they 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 wanted to make themselves autonomous, right? Like, yeah, there was a sign that said, "You are now leaving the United States," as if it was, as if that was crossing some international border, uh, but. Clearly, they were they were still using United States uh, infrastructure, and, and you know the, the city was providing the materials. So they weren't truly an autonomous zone, and and that's why a lot of people were making fun of these essentially larpers for try, you know playing like oh we're you know we're our own little thing, even though we still use power, and electricity, and, and gas, and all the water and all this stuff. And the city provided port potties for them. Yeah, but by, by the way, we should we should we should just in case people don't understand the term, now, LARPer is a live action role playing um, yeah. participant. Yeah. Just to, just to let people know what that what LARPer yeah, means. Yeah, just people playing pretend, <laughs> right? A, a like a really really dedicated uh, playing of pretend, and so that's why they then pivoted to Chop, which which stood for stood for a couple of things: the Capitol Hill organized protest, the Capitol Hill, which was the neighborhood in Seattle. Capitol Hill organized protests, and one of kind of the more outspoken activists who who was there that I saw a lot when I, when I was there for that week, uh, he was explaining that, oh, well, the reason why we changed from Chaz to Chop is because we actually still want to uh, peace, we wanted to peacefully protest under the rights that are, that, are, that the United States recognizes uh in the constitution and so obviously if you are saying you're an autonomous zone and you're not part of the united states well then the united states can then come in and say you know obviously in theory be like okay well we don't recognize this because you you you're forgoing those rights that 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 we that we recognize because you're no longer part of the united states. it's just like this weird like they, they they never think things through right i mean and right. that definitely speaks to the broader uh social justice racial equity movement uh, uh, today and, and especially back then is just, well, we're going to do this right away because it, it, it sounds good and, and or it's justified in the moment. But then when 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 the dust is finally settled, it's oh, it was actually a very bad thing. What actually happened or it just doesn't make sense, like with an autonomous zone in, in Seattle. Right. So Julio, again, is the author. Julio Rosas is the author of uh, fiery but mostly peaceful. Now that I know how to pronounce it, I'm going to say it several times. Fiery but mostly peaceful. A book that you should and could, can and and should get immediately, so that you can start reading through this. It's a, it's a um, 
both a, a personal journey through several of America's worst riots of 2020 um, and 2021, for that matter, uh, as yeah. well as a, a real indictment of the media. In fact, if you look at the if you look at the uh, ta uh, table of contents, you'll see that Julio has actually structured each of these chapters with a heading that is basically a media myth, <laughs> which, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's exactly subtle, but I do wonder how many people are going to look at that and go, oh, OK, now I understand what Julio is actually trying to do here. But things like Democrats care about ordinary people, BLM cares about the black community and wokeness of COVID, Antifa is a myth. I mean, every single one of these chapters here is basically a media myth about um, about what was going on in 2020. Um, have you seen, I mean, we'll, we'll wrap up with this because I don't want to keep you too much longer, Julio, but have you seen any sort of sense that the media has learned any lessons from this or has, or has decided <laughs> to go back and revisit? Yeah, I know you're, you're laughing already, but I, I gotta ask. No, has I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. No. So the answer is no. Uh, they have not learned their lesson and we are seeing this today with the Roe versus Wade protests that are happening right now. They are once again, making excuses to a, to a left wing cause because they either agree with it or they just don't want to make them look bad. And so the protesting outside of the Supreme Court justices homes, one, it's against federal law. Right. And yet we've seen multiple examples of people within the mainstream media making excuses for it. Uh, we see Democrats making excuse by and large dick durbin's uh, senator dick durbin's probably the only one that i've heard that has said uh don't do that but i mean from the white house jen saki she was saying as long as they're basically saying as long as they remain peaceful you know that's all we care about uh and and now funny and today she was complaining that the arlington gop allegedly is spreading her home address around <laughs> and it's oh okay so 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 protesting and going to government officials homes is, is bad again all right so it, it, no, they haven't learned their lesson because was there the the, the Chiron writer at CNN with the fire of mostly peaceful in Kenosha was he fired was he was he disciplined I don't know CNN didn't say uh, was you know Ali Velshi when he made his dumb remark did he get punished not to my knowledge he's clearly still at the network and still right. an anchor. Uh, no, nobody, nobody learned their lesson because no one to hold them accountable because who's going to hold the people in power accountable within the media themselves? Of course not. Why would they? There's no incentive. They, they, they believe that the ends justify the means. And especially with 2020, there was Donald Trump still in office. And so they could use that as, uh, and of course this was before January 6th and January 6th just gave them just that extra um for that. But prior right. to that, it was just, so no. No lessons were learned, and that's why it feels like today, with the, the potential for more leftist violence, it feels like to me like we're in a car and we're just speeding like full gas ahead into a tree trunk off the side of the highway, and no one wants to pump the brakes. Yep. And it, it, I feel like we're, I just, I, and I don't want to be like doom and gloom preacher or whatever, but it's just my experience and, and seeing the reaction and seeing how everyone just moved on it, it's just people are just seem fine with fine with again resorting to violence because well reproductive rights is is more important than <laughs> than the stability of the country so we're going right. to do what we want to make sure that it, it stays that way and so i mean it, like if it happens i'll be out there covering it covering it all but it's not good for the country it's not good for uh regular everyday americans and you know if it happens I, I, you know unfortunately people are going to get hurt right uh, and and that's and that's the sad thing and all about all of it and you can find out much more about that and julio's fantastic reporting at uh, fiery but mostly mostly peaceful so look that up i'll have a link in the show post when this goes live so you can just click down onto that but fiery but mostly peaceful and Julio, where can people find you other than um, on Amazon, of course, and Barnes and Noble and other fine bookstore sites? Where can people find you on Twitter? Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, so juliorosas.com uh, is my website. Uh, you can find on Twitter, Julio underscore Rosas 11. Uh, the book is also in Target, Walmart, Thrift Books, Books a Million. Uh, all, all were. It's also available in audio format, uh, narrated by myself because. Good for you. <laughs> it, yeah, I, 
I didn't want to do it, but it's my story, so it had to be in my voice. So I thought, okay. Uh, and then also, it's uh, in e ebook format as well. Excellent. See all sorts of different ways that you can get this. Maybe you should get two or three different versions of this, just so you can make sure that you have it handy. But uh, do get Fiery but Mostly Peaceful by Julio Rosas, and of course, Julio is also at Townhall.com. Uh, so that you can find some of his uh, up-to-date reporting. His his most recent reporting will, will be there. And uh, at Julio Rosas on Twitter. Julio, thanks so much for being with us today. Great talking with you. Thank you for having me. Don't, uh, don't turn that dial, folks. We'll be back with more from the Ed Morrissey Show shortly. Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. And it wouldn't be a Tuesday without the prince of Twitter, the regent of Red State himself, Andrew Malcolm at A.H. Malcolm on Twitter's is, and of course at redstate.com where he does VIP columns. We're going to talk about that right off the bat. And I say that it wouldn't be Tuesdays without Andrew, except that there's going to be a couple of Tuesdays without Andrew, right, Andrew? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's called the grandparenting for a change. Yeah. <laughs> It's one reason we left California was to uh, get closer to grandchildren. Now we're going to get some, some real uh, intense time. Yeah, this is this is one of those this is one of those uh, instances where the marketing doesn't match the reality. Um, and uh, by the way, in today's New York Times, I, I have a post that's coming up on this. It'll be up by the time that this podcast goes up. But there's <laughs> there's a it's actually a really good expose, and I'm not making fun of the of the journalistic work that went into this, but the New York Times has a very lengthy expose about the adult site OnlyFans and how the fact is that when people think they're interacting with these nude models, it's actually interacting with an office, you know, cubicle farm of <laughs> people who are basically catfishing them. And um, and it's like, yeah, you know, Chris Rock 20 something years ago said it best. There is no sex in the champagne room, none. <laughs> If you're fooled by this, it's only because you're fooling yourself. Yeah. Well, there was a, one of my favorite signs. I collect signs or pictures of signs. And the, one of my favorite one was a bar in Alaska. And it said, gluten-free lap dances. <laughs> so you see, honey, it's, it's actually healthy. Yes. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's low fat, too. It's, uh, it's amazing. Um, but so... That being said, there are there are media outlets, I, and, and again, I, I I really do think that this is a, a fine piece of work by the New York Times, and you should read it all. Um, I just find it probably more likely that people are, are willingly de deluding themselves in this transaction. But um, speaking of media delusions, though, <laughs> and we're going to get to that shortly, but I want to start off with, um, because we always talk about media delusions here with Andrew. And um, but we want to start off with Andrew's observations on the war in Ukraine, because his VIP column for Red State on Sunday was excellent. The headline is nothing's gone right for Putin in his Ukraine invasion. Will he give up? And in the time that it took us to discuss this, of course, we are finding out more about just what's going wrong for Russia. They're, they gotten, uh, the Ukrainians have made it all the way now to the back to their own border in uh, Kharkiv. And the Russians had an absolute debacle in a river cross, attempted river crossing, oh, where they yeah. lost dozens of uh, tanks in basically what turned out to be a turkey shoot with um, Ukrainian artillery, which then crossed that same river without any problem whatsoever. I mean, Russia's really, um, they're, they're running out of gas on this thing, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, they have, they have a terrible NCO core. Uh, and you know, it's something that uh, dictatorships, uh, the, um, the officers and the non-commissioned officers, they get afraid of doing anything on their own initiative. One of the great strengths of the Western allies and especially the US Army was if a platoon ran into trouble, the lieutenant or the captain took it upon himself to find a solution. That doesn't happen with the Russians. They, they wait for orders. And that's why so many generals were at the front. Uh, and seven of them had been picked off by snipers because they were stalled. Nobody was doing anything, giving any orders. And what happened at that river crossing was, I mean, uh, no army outside of Russia, I think, 
would would make that mistake. They had all the vehicles gathered to crawl, ready to cross the river. Well, you don't put everything in one place, especially when the enemy has drones, and the and, and the drones are taking pictures and sending it back to the new artillery that Biden sent over, the big 155 millimeter. And they just pounded, as you pointed out, they pounded the hell out of it. I think it was 47 armored vehicles were destroyed. And they tried it twice, didn't work out. Um, and so things are not going well. Uh, they're not, uh, it, it's not that the Ukrainian, Ukrainian army is great and, and they have a wonderful will and they're fighting for their own country. The Russian army is conscripts and they've been told that they would be welcome. So they're flabbergasted that their people are fighting back and their poor tactics, terrible communications. At one point early on, Ed, their radios were so shoddy, the Russians, that they were stealing Ukrainian cell phones and communicating that way. Russians communicating with each other in Ukraine with Ukrainian cell phones. Right. And guess what? Ukrainians don't have to jam it. They can listen in. So they knew exactly what they were going to do and where they were going to go. Plus, they've got the American intelligence um, helping right. them out and eavesdropping. And who knows who else? Uh, only the Americans seem to talk about, well, great intelligence they're getting. Yeah, you know, that's a, it's like the old um, fight club joke right the first rule of intelligence club is you don't talk about intelligence club and the second rule <laughs> of intelligence club is you don't talk about intelligence club that's we seem right. to be, follow follow rule one yeah we, yeah we seem don't we seem to have not learned that lesson but to your point i mean um the the performance in the field is one thing but putin's also basically screwing up in the um uh the geopolitical uh sense as well because the invasion of ukraine I think the you know if it had if it actually had taken only seventy two hours to decapitate Ukraine's government and for Russia to um, to exert its will over Ukraine, uh, it might have just been seen as a fait accompli and everybody in the in the region would have just perhaps you know objected to it but not done much to uh, to reverse it. But now you've got Finland and Sweden who are going to join already have said today they're going to jointly apply for NATO membership. NATO says they're going to um, they're going to uh, accelerate that process in order to get them in quickly and they're going to extend military protection in the meantime while that while that process goes on. This is a, a, a major humiliation oh, for Vladimir huge. Putin. Yeah. Yeah, this is the biggest defense structure change since World War II. Uh, and this was the point of the column was uh, Putin's um, plan was to intimidate the West, to break up NATO, to uh, and to weaken the alliance by this pipeline, which was going to make them all reliable on Russian energy. Um, and he saw that the he thought he saw that the alliance was fractured. Well, guess what? It isn't. They've all come together. They've frozen the pipeline. It's not, it's not done. So he's getting no income from there. He's shut off electricity to Finland. And so Finland and Sweden, Sweden has been neutral for like two centuries. And suddenly they're saying, you know what? Um, being a good neighbor doesn't work. And we're going to get in and we're going to enter the alliance. And that will actually be safer for everybody because there won't be two weak links up in the, in the um, Scandinavian countries. Norway has, was an original founding partner Right. Um, and the Baltic states are in, have been. Um, so despite Putin's threats, in fact, the president of Finland called Putin up uh, and said, you know, we're going to join. And uh, I guess he was anticipating an explosion. Uh, and Putin told him, no, this is a big mistake. And uh, the president says that he said, uh, no, Ukraine is a big mistake. Uh, and so Putin yeah, is actually, look in the mirror. I think is I, yeah, I think look yeah. in the mirror is what what uh, yeah. what's his name Sauli. Um, oh, I can't think of his last yeah, name. Yeah, I know. I, I like Sauli have, though. Sauli's good. That's a that's a great first name by the they way. Have, they have funny names over there. <laughs> um, and um, well, Finland has a very strong military, a strong military tradition. Uh, Russia does. or the Soviet Union invaded them in 1939, and they in uh, 
occupied part of Finland for a few months. Um, so they're, they're aware uh, of the military. And of course, uh, Sweden has a, a vibrant arms industry um, with Saab and um, what's the, oh, a ball. And ABBA. Ball. Abba, yeah, Abba sings about Waterloo. That's that's part of that's part well, of Sweden. exactly, exactly. <laughs> Abba. And Bofors. So, uh, it's it's. I mean, it's a dramatic change. Uh, now, it's a dramatic. Uh, I don't want to be. Uh, what's the word? Uh, I don't know. It seems to me we need to think these things through. Okay, yeah. now. What's what's being affected is countries on the border of Russia. That's Ukraine, which apparently saw it coming, and they've been practicing and re, uh, um, strategizing for a long time, and it's been very effective so far. They're outgunned. They're outmanned, I mean. Um, and the Scandinavian countries, um, which, you know, there are no pushovers. So Russia or Putin has created his own mess. And it's the exact opposite of what he wanted. He wanted everybody to be fractured and uh, intimidated. Nobody's intimidated and they're, they're, they're uniting even stronger. Yeah, there's a difference between um, implied power or uh, um, uh, potential power and, uh, or a potential threat maybe is even a better way to put it, potential threat and, and actual threat. The potential threat from Russia on paper was massive. The actual threat, as it turns out in the field, apart from the nuclear weapons, of course, which are, you know, obviously a, a separate consideration, but they're conventional. They're, the conventional threat from Russia is negligible. I mean, yeah. it very easily defeated in the field. And um, and the only thing that you the only thing that they had were numbers, and even those are getting whittled away. There are some estimates today, uh, being Monday, that the Russians may have lost as, as, as much as one third of its fighting force already in just three months of, um, of conflict in Ukraine. And I mean, that's a, a less than three months. I mean, we're about a week shy of three months and that's an astounding no, yeah. uh, outcome. It's just, it's, it's so inept. It's so in, incompetent as to, as to beg the question of is how long, can Putin survive, which is the point of your, uh, one of the points yeah, of your how column. how long can he survive? And well, he doesn't have an exit ramp at the moment. Remember uh, George Aiken during, the, he was a senator from Vermont during the Vietnam War. Yep. He said, you know, when things were messed up, he said, you know, we should just declare victory and go home. Uh, and yeah, it's, I, I don't know how he could convince people it was a victory, but he could say it is. Um, if if Putin just keeps the eastern part of Ukraine that his insurgent forces and his own army have captured, he keeps Crimea and declare a victory. Now, that still would deny um, Ukraine uh, a port, but um, I don't know. Well, we'll see what happens, but right. uh, it, and the other thing is, I, I'm not sure we can go by what's rational for Putin. He's not been rational. Uh, and if he really is sick, you know, at that victory parade last week, um, he was sitting there in 48 degree weather with a blanket wrapped around his legs. Well, yeah, you, he, you, he yeah, was you mentioned the only that. One. Yeah, he was the only one. Uh, the others had coats on and so did he, but... Uh, he wasn't standing, so no one was standing. Um, you know, remember in the old days, the Soviet days, all the leaders would line up on the edge of the Kremlin and they would watch the parades go by and people would judge who was in power by where they were standing. There's, there was, uh, there's none of that. Uh, so it's, it, we don't know for sure that Putin is sick, but he sure looks like it. He was walking a little bit strangely at that parade, heavy, heavy footed. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, Russia, he's, uh, he turned 70 this year. Biden turns 80 this year. And both of us, both of our countries have leaders who are not well. Yep. We do indeed. So be sure it's, to, it's, yeah. It's not a healthy mix. It is not a healthy mix. 
Be sure to read all of Andrew's column, of course, at Red State, redstate.com, where he is the regent of Red State. But I want to move on to uh, some media bias stuff just because oh, I yeah. love throwing this stuff at you. Politico. <laughs> Politico had two articles in the last few days. <clears throat> one on Friday and one on Monday, which is today. We're discussing this on Monday. And the one on Friday uh, posited that um, the that the Biden administration was being forced to manage the COVID-19 pandemic on, and I quote, a shoestring budget because <laughs> Congress would not pass an additional $10 billion in funding um, off budget, of course. Um, and this was a remarkable piece of work. I think it was Adam Cancrin that, that wrote this particular piece. It was a remarkable piece of work, Andrew, because not there isn't a single mention in this entire, at least there wasn't when I read it on Friday morning, there wasn't a single mention in the entire article of the American Rescue Plan, which was Joe Biden's um, $1.9 trillion COVID funding plan that passed in March 2021, which is just almost exactly 14 months ago that you know Congress allocated almost $2 trillion for this. Now, of course, some of this got spent on stimulus. I think about $500 billion of it went directly into consumers' pockets. Oh, peanuts. Yeah, I mean, that still leaves you with $1.4 trillion, which would be about $100 billion a month. And then I ran those numbers against the annual budgets <laughs> for, for um, uh, you know, for uh, various different departments. You know, that $1.4 trillion, that's almost exactly twice what the Department of Defense is going to get all year. And I've never heard anybody, anybody claim that the Department of Defense was being run on a shoestring budget. I mean, I don't even think the Department of Defense would be that shameless, right? I don't think they're going no. to say, oh, you know, we're being run on a shoestring budget. Um, I mean, it's, this is an absurd, I, there, isn't, there wasn't a single mention of this. There wasn't a single mention of the issue that's holding this up, which is that Republicans and perhaps even Joe Manchin uh, in, in the Senate one an account of, accounting of what Biden's already done with the 1.9 trillion he was appropriated 14 months ago, plus what was the other, what was it, uh, close to uh, three and a half trillion that was spent in the two preceding off-budget appropriations for pa for pandemic management. There's been no accounting for this spending. Nobody really no, knows where the money's no, at. No, and that's the way they like it. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Wow. Uh -huh. Andrew Malcolm sings disco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know it it's just stunning and i wonder how much the new ownership had uh sway had in that in in forming that article you remember politico was bought this year by axel springer the german the german rupert murdoch yep um and um i don't know politico has has been uh, pretty good with some stuff, but you're right. These things just scream uh, in the pocket. Well, I, I mean, it's, it's stenography. I mean, this is, I mean, it's clearly, I mean, I mean, he mentions White House sources and that's fine. People write about, people write. Well, you, what, could do, you could just say that. That doesn't mean you had any. Well, right. Well, also well, that, that's true. But also you could also say the White House report, the White House complains that they're being forced to do this on a shoestring budget and at least bring up the American Rescue Plan as some sort of context for that claim. I mean, well, yeah. this is, I mean, it's it's stenography in the piece today, um, which um, was on Joe Biden's supposedly, uh, supposedly his new determination, Andrew, and you're going to love this, that He's done playing nice with Republicans. Oh, yeah. he's going to get tough now. <laughs> he's he's going to get tough. He's he's done trying for bipartisanship. He's done reaching out with all of branches like, you know, Jim Crow 2.0. Uh, you're standing with Bull Connor and George Wallace. You know, all of branches like that that Joe Biden's been yeah. offering all along. Yeah, Mr. Nice Guy. Oh, I mean, it's a piece of work. And, and you can't, you can't believe anything he says i mean some of it may be true but you can't believe any of it because he turns around remember when peter Ducey asked them about there were three instances where he publicly said something and then within minutes the white house staff had to run out and walk it back and he asked them that right on camera and biden said didn't happen yeah i mean it, it's just, it's so blatant, it's stunning. You can't, 
<laughs> you can't fathom it. And the media just goes along with it. I, I It's so outrageous. Well, I don't I mean, I kind of expect that from whoever the press secretary, the deputy press secretary is, because that that post has always had an element of spin to it. But of late, and I don't mean just in this particular administration, of of late, lately, um, it has become all spin all the time. It's basically the spin cycle on your washer and no wash, <laughs> no rinse. It's all spin. Um and I mean, we're almost to that point where it's like, you know, broadly accepted that that's what the the purpose of that is. I mean, uh, just today, as we're talking about this, um, the, uh, the, the brand new press secretary, who's Corinne Jean-Pierre, who, by the way, is still blocking me on her personal account, even though we've never interacted at all. I just want to mention that. <laughs> Free Ed Morrissey. Um, but um, <laughs> but uh, Corinne Jean-Pierre is it gives this answer reporter is saying the baby formula shortage doesn't seem like a situation that would have required mind reading which was the biden's claim right on thursday or friday well we're not mind readers are there specific actions that this administration took in february or any earlier because uh the, the it was baby coming yeah well it'd been it'd been reported on in, in, as early as the first week of october 2021 the new york times ran a lengthy piece about shortages in formula and diapers and the fact that people parents couldn't find them this is before the fda you know even had their stop production order on abbott um there was reports in january there were reports a month ago and this was what jean pierre responded you've seen my colleagues on your networks we've been working on this 24 7. well since friday maybe <laughs> i mean cnn has a piece up right now andrew in fact that that um is um less than impressed I guess we can say less than impressed with the um, with the effort that the um, that the Biden administration has put into this. You know what the response has been? Oh, a website which points you to <laughs> the customer service numbers for Abbott, for Gerber. I, I think oh. what's the other one for um, uh, what's the other one? Hang on for just a second. Um, let's see, Abbott. Abbott Gerber and give me just a second and I'll look this up. Um, okay. I'm, I'm wreck it, hungry. wreck it, right? And the the the, the people who answer the hotlines for Wreck It and Gerber will tell parents who call up looking to find out where they can buy formula that they can't buy any because there isn't any. <laughs> if they had it, it'd be on store shelves. The people who call up the Abbott hotline, however, which the new White House. Uh, website helpfully points out at hhh.gov slash formula will tell you will tell people who call up that that line isn't really going to uh, they don't answer consumer questions on that line anyway <laughs> i mean it's it's it's, it's so shoddy it's it, just shoddy it's absolutely shoddy somebody somebody got caught with their pants down and created a website right and i give cnn a lot of credit mj lee is the reporter who worked on this mj lee did what reporters are supposed to do they, they're reporting the claim from the white house right and then they go investigate it to see if, it, if the claim makes see any sense works. right well you know we've talked i've written about this you've written about it and we've talked about it on this show biden is a reactive president he doesn't really plan ahead uh, remember last year um trump had set the withdrawal from afghanistan for april the uh, late April, because uh, that's before the fighting season starts. Biden came in and delayed it to September, then he backed it up into August, but that's the peak fighting season. So he wasn't ready to be sh uh, shellacked then. He, didn't, he doesn't listen to generals. Robert Gates in his books has written about how uh, Biden does not trust the military, was always saying to Obama, you can't trust these guys. They're just in it for themselves. Boy, what a stance for a commander in chief to take. Right. Um, and um, so then the generals say, well, you know, you got to keep 2,500 guys in to oversee an evacuation. Biden says, nope, everybody comes out which of course meant there was no evacuation until 6,000 went back in and they all got all messed up and people died uh, and thousands still didn't get evacuated. 
and he Biden claims this as a big success. Well, this is so typical of of how he operates things. He's late to figure something. He's always late for meetings. He's late for press briefings. He's late for everything. He's late to realize that uh, he needs to do something. And when it doesn't work out, he blames somebody else. You know, it's a powerful thing I learned when I was in politics is a little dose of humility. That's all it takes. Is on, Now, he, he can't say it as often as he screws up. That, that would be ridiculous. But every now and then, Biden could say, you know, I was disappointed in my own performance over X. I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't live up to the promises. I learned from it, and I hope you give me uh, room to, to grow. Yep. And pe- people, Americans want to be trusting of the president. They want to respect him. But when he throws stuff in their face, defiance and ignorance and mumbo jumbo, uh, they go, Why? what? And I think there's one poll now with him at 39%. Uh, it's it's um, it's a disaster, and um, I I have a I had a an, we, we, I do a little short audio commentary. I'm sorry, Ed. I do a podcast without you. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do a short three or three or four minute commentary, and the one I put up today was about um, uh, was right about this subject. Uh, don't get cocky about the midterms for uh, Republicans because uh, they thought for sure Monica Lewinsky would, would sink Democrats in 1998. I was at the RNC in those days, and it didn't. They actually gained seats. So uh, it's, uh, it's very dangerous to get so confident. The media is full of it, and it may be intentional. Oh my gosh, it's going to be terrible in the fall. It's going to be terrible. And then when it's only half terrible, they'll claim a big victory for Joe Biden. Well, yeah. And uh, speaking of which, by the way, we should probably mention just briefly the NBC News poll that uh, that showed that uh, after that big leak at the Supreme Court that Joe Biden jumped all over, that Chuck Schumer jumped all over with the most extreme abortion uh, bill ever floated in Congress that went nowhere. Uh, the American people's are, the American people have really shifted in in the midterms. They now think that Joe Biden is screwing up even worse than before, and seventy five percent of people think that the country is going in the wrong direction. And Joe Biden has his lowest job approval rating and personal favorability rating in the poll series. Um, and as it turns out, abortion uh, abortion did actually increase in terms of people who have it as their Number one priority. It went from three point three percent to um, ten percent, <laughs> and yeah. that's in the middle of that's in the middle of the initial media hysteria, wall to wall coverage of this thing. Right? This is this poll is is not good news for Democrats on lots of different levels. Yeah, yeah. There haven't been very many good ones uh, for Democrats, uh, and that's what I say. We shouldn't get overconfident. Uh, uh, about Republicans taking at least the House, maybe the Senate, um, but because uh, all kinds of things can happen, um, and there can be a rally around the flag with Biden, even though he couldn't hold it. It's a uh, it's a dangerous situation. I'm I I, I want to get at least one House so that we can freeze any of this pipe dream progressive stuff that they have. My gosh. They know it's going to end, so they're trying to rush through scads and scads of stuff. Yes, indeed, that's the case. I I, I do want to say though that uh, we can we can talk about the big news, the huge news out of the Supreme Court today. They added a decision day so they could announce today that um, Ted Cruz could go on fundraising. Sorry, folks. <laughs> it's actually an interesting decision, but. You know, all of us are are crowded around scotusblog.com and 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 their live blog there, which is fantastic, always is. And we're we're waiting for the orders to drop. We're waiting for the for the decisions to drop. And we all went away and uh, felt punked. We we felt like Andrew. I think the best the best analogy I can come up with is we felt like um, a consumer who thought he was really chatting with a 
hot supermodel, <laughs> hot, hot naked supermodel on OnlyFans, only to find out that he was really just talking with an e pimp. Um, after reading that New York Times thing. <laughs> an e pimp. Oh, I hadn't heard that. Yeah, that's, that's good. The, they actually the 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 company that does this <laughs> performs this service for for OnlyFans models. Calls themselves e pimps. I mean, that was a, 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 you got to read the article. It's actually really again. I'd highly recommend reading the article, especially if you're stupid enough to actually subscribe to an OnlyFans account. But well, you're saying I'm not getting my money's worth. I'm saying that that hot chick is is not really interacting with you, and huh. um, uh, and um, the other thing is is you know that when the Hooters waitress says that. Uh, she's really happy to see you because the bunch of losers just left and we're and you're really cool. That may not be accurate. That may not be accurate. <laughs> that may, yeah. That may. It, I mean, I'm not going to guarantee it in every single instance, but it, it just may not be accurate. So just you know, be aware, guys. <laughs> oh, funny thing. One of my sons, his wife went away for the weekend, and he sent her pictures of. He took the kids to lunch at Hooters. <laughs> Did he roll? <laughs> He's. He's got more guts than I would ever have. I'm oh, telling you that right I mean, now. It was wonderful. Well, he's the kind of guy who would get away with it. But, I mean, it's just so funny. These kids having a great time, and here's these Hooters girls, ladies, and uh, and he's taking a picture, sending it to his wife. Yeah, hon, I'm taking care of them. I got it. Well, uh, on that note, I guess we're going to have to talk about the jokes of the week because uh, okay. uh, well, that, might be, that, that might be the most awesome um, uh, uh stunt pulled of the week but we got to talk about the jokes of the week okay well i got these are replays myers replay says the fitness company peloton has recalled two of its treadmills after reports of injuries involving children that's crazy who can afford a peloton and children yeah great question i i i <laughs> I, I question that the validity of that report yeah 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 uh, Letterman uh, replays as Osama bin Laden's diary, April 12th. Dear diary, awful TV reception, death to Time Warner. April 20th, dear diary, three wives, one bathroom. You do the math. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, very another very timely one, Jay Leno. He says, Hollywood is talking now about making a new Mad Max movie where people steal and kill over limited gas supplies at some time in the future, like July. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to a theater near you really soon. Uh, all right. I've got a joke for you. So it was on, it's a Twitter joke. It's not my joke. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to credit the account at John talks gaming uh, for this joke. Two conspiracy theorists walk into a bar. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> I know Andrew's already seen this because he retweeted. Uh, oh, I just love that one. I just love it. I love great? it. There's some, there's some good ones on there. Like um, a bear walks into a bar and a bartender says, what do you have? The bear says, I'll have a beer. And the bartender says, okay, but why the long pause? And the bear says, I'm a bear. Uh, I blew it. Why the big pause? Why the big I'm pause? I'm a bear. Yeah, yeah, I'm a bear. Right. yeah. Oh, I blew Why, it. That's hey, My look. Bad. I mean, you're, you're 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 reliable. Your timing is impeccable and reliable. Uh, and ninety nine times it. out of a hundred. Ninety nine. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, this was one of the ones that wasn't. Why the big pause? Anyway, yeah. Why the big pause? All right. I'm well, a bear. Now, Andrew is going to be gone for the next couple of weeks. Because uh, he's going to be off doing those commentaries without me. No, that's not true. He's he's got family. He's got some great family stuff coming up, and so he's going to take a little time off. We'll be back in three weeks with each other, so you know, stay tuned for that. And of course, make sure you're following the Prince of Twitter on Twitter at ah Malcolm. Also, the Regent of Red State, RedState.com. That's where he's got his columns up. VIP most of the time, sometimes not in the clear though, so keep checking in, and that's where his commentary is posted as well. Andrew, as always, thanks for being here. Have yourself a great vacation. We'll catch up when Thank you get you. back. Okay, I will. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, everybody. See ya. All right, folks, stay tuned for more from the Ed Morrissey Show coming right after this. This is Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com for Town Hall.
Two weeks after a leaked Supreme Court draft opinion in a key abortion case, polls show that Americans remain focused on other issues and on Joe Biden's failure to address them. A new NBC News poll shows Biden's job approval rating slipping to its lowest level yet, and also that a majority of voters disapprove of Biden on a personal basis. What about Roe? Little has changed despite the media hysteria over Justice Samuel Alito's draft. Only 37% of voters agree with the bill pushed by Biden and Chuck Schumer that would prevent any restrictions on abortion to the moment of birth. Only 10% of respondents in the survey, taken just days after the leak, see abortion as their top priority in the midterms. 40% chose inflation and the economy, and Biden only gets a 23% approval rating on the cost of living. Abortion won't save Democrats, not even with media assistance, and neither will President Biden. I'm Ed Morrissey. Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. I am really very honored to uh, introduce to you again our friend Sally Pipes, President, CEO, and Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Health, uh, for Healthcare Policy at the Pacific Research Institute. Her latest book is False Premise, False Promise, The Disastrous Reality of Medicare for All. And of course, she's on Twitter, as are most of us. She's at Sally Pipes, at Sally Pipes. And Sally, welcome back. It's been a while since we've talked to you. I know. Well, thank you for having me back. A lot going on in many aspects of our of our policy debates. There are. And I, I want to just start this off because this is a policy debate about health care. Um, and I love policy debates. Unfortunately, you and I seem to be a vanishing breed who think that that's what elections are about. And <laughs> so, I mean, I, I love your piece here in Newsmax. It was from Friday at uh, Newsmax.com, which is GOP must seize control of the health care narrative. And I think you're right about this. But I, I, at least in terms of policy and policy formation, I think in terms of politics, though, the GOP is trying not to um, seize on anything other than Joe Biden and Democrats. And that might be electorally wise if it is somewhat cynical. Yes, well, I, I agree with you. And, you know, I mean, the Republicans have had so many opportunities, you know, to do some really good things on health care. And for some reason, they'd rather, you know, run down what the Democrats are doing instead yeah. of coming up with a positive agenda. We've got to have something that the voters can can say, I like those ideas and I'm going to vote for you. Yeah. And, and Sally, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And again, I am a I am very much a um, policy guy. I think that the purpose of politics is policy, not that the purpose of policy is politics. And I think you've written a very wise um, prescription here for how Republicans really need to frame health care for a public that it might not be their first priority, it might not even be their second priority, but it's usually a kitchen table priority for people when they're voting. And Republicans got burned on this four years ago after promising to to uh, yes. to repeal Obamacare. They, they ended up not having a plan at all, even though you had a very good plan, you kept re kept referring to it. They really do need to come up with a, with a a policy that can get at least a broad consensus within their own caucus so that they can present it as a as a coherent reform on health care. My question for you is, in, in regards to what you're writing here, is it too late for Republicans to do that? Well, I certainly hope not. I've been in this, you know, I'm a former Canadian. I moved here in 91 to get away from the Canadian socialized system. And, you know, I, we've been fighting this for 30 years. I hope it's not too late. I think, you know, in particular, you know, it, it is a kitchen table discussion piece. And particularly, everybody has health issues in their family. And so the American public is very interested in, you know, getting that kind of health care that is going to suit the needs of themselves and their families. And so we really need this. And it it's not it's not too late. I mean, November uh, 2022 is I can't believe it's almost um, June, but, you know, it is just around the corner in, in the terms of politics. But it's not too late. The Republicans have to, you know, get their act together, as you say. I mean, Obamacare, you know, the Republicans had promised to repeal and replace it. It didn't happen. And now they continue to build, you know, with higher subsidies, you know, more this and more that more expansion of, of Medi-Cal uh, Medicare. And, and Medicaid. And yet, um, you know, we, we just have to, you know, have the Republicans have to have a plan that voters can get their mind around because in the polling, it, it shows 
the in the polling, Americans want competition and choice. Only 36% of those polled um, recently support Medicare for all. And yet Bernie Sanders, Pramila Jayapal, they're out there at all the time saying, we need to expand, we need Medicare for all, we need single payer, we need the public option as a stepping stone, which would be a government insurance plan to compete against private insurers. So the Republicans have got to get their act together and, and come up with a plan that people can get their minds around and, and support a candidate and vote for them. Well, I, I, I'd certainly love to see that. And I think your plan is, 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 is sound. Um, and you do mention the polling on this. Two thirds of voters reject the idea that more government control is the best way to fix our health care system. I um, mean, this is really pushback, I think, based on the incompetence of government over the last really the last 14 months. But you could even go all the way back to the, the, the covid pandemic and the um, the sort of Keystone Cops mandates on mandates off masks on masks off uh you know confusion that was clearly um ping-ponging around in both the biden and trump administrations um so they but they do want people to have a plan they both they want both parties to have a plan and your argument is that republicans should build a plan uh, that's built on market-oriented healthcare successes from the past especially health savings accounts which i use and I, it's fantastic um right. And, and and that this is a way to to put consumers in control of their own health care, their own health care choices and their own health care purchases, really, if you want to look at it in, in, in those terms. And I, I think that that's a good place to start. The question becomes, can you advance that ball without having to demolish Obamacare? I mean, you and I both would like to see it demolished, but... Right now, politically speaking, is it even viable to do that? And uh, do do you see any plan? Do you see any you know ideas that Republicans are even thinking that big? Well, I mean, as yes, you and I fought very hard trying to educate people on why you know Obamacare was not going to be successful and it needed to be repealed and replaced. And as you know. Obama said the two main goals of Obamacare, one, were to achieve universal coverage, and second, to bring the cost of health care down. Neither one of those goals has, has been achieved. And so, you know, HSA's health savings accounts, I think, even though I agree with you, I think, I think most of the people in our camp, the other policy leaders that I work with, think that Obamacare is not going to be repealed and replaced um, at, in in the current environment and maybe even in the future, but we certainly need a plan to expand competition and choice. Americans have choice in all aspects of their life and government, you know, is such a big player in healthcare. 50% of healthcare is in the hands of government through Medicare, Medicaid, the CHIP program for kids and the, and the VA. And so health savings accounts puts people back in charge of their healthcare and it needs to be expanded. I have an HSA, you have an HSA. I use it whenever, you know, I, I go to the doctor and it's something's not going to be covered in insurance. I use my HSA a lot. And it, 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 you know, you are careful when you're spending your own money. Milton Friedman used to say, you know, with, with um, employer-based coverage, it's first dollar coverage. People don't care what something at the doctor costs because their insurance is paying for it, even though their wages are going to be lower because your company is paying for your coverage. But health savings accounts, we need to expand the amount of money that you can put away right, right, you know, in your account, which is uh, tax free. You can carry that money forward. And so thirty six hundred and fifty dollars for an individual, seventy three hundred dollars for a family. It needs to be a lot more. Plus the fact that, you know, people on Medicare are banned from, you know, uh, contributing to their HSA. People on Medicare, a lot of people on Medicare are, have been very successful and they should be able to put money into their health savings account and they will be um, careful when, when they use it. Well, I think, and this is what we, this is what you mean when you say build on HSAs as a framework for freedom is first off expanding them to Medicare patients, which I think is a great idea. And I don't even really understand why you wouldn't allow uh, uh, people who are on Medicare um, to put some tax-free dollars aside because Medicare is not an HMO. I mean, it doesn't cover all the costs. And uh, it, so you, you're going to have some out-of-pocket when you're dealing with Medicare, no matter what. Um, there, there are other ways, there are other things here too uh, that you suggest, which is, you know, short-term health care plans, um, flexible coverage health care plans of the kinds that Obamacare has um, initially uh, voided. And 
and honestly, that particular issue, I think, really deserves a lot of um, thought, especially in terms of expanding HSAs, because most Americans, or well, I say most younger, most younger Americans anyway, are likely overinsured in this case. They're not going to. They're they're spending far more money on premiums than they'll ever spend in the doctor's office, with just some rare exceptions. And it would make a lot more sense for them to have smaller uh, health care plans and HSAs to backstop them in case of uh, emergencies. Well, exactly. I mean, you know, Ed, we're not at that, you know, we're not 30 years old anymore or 20, <laughs> 32, whatever. Um, and so we visit the doctor more often. But for young people, why should a young 28 year old, you know, have to buy a plan or be part of a plan in his company, which, you know, covers everything from alcohol rehabilitation to in vitro fertilization when they don't want those things at that point in their life. And if they could get a short term limited duration plan, which Obama, you know, made very, very difficult and Trump tried to expand it. But, you know, California, New York, Massachusetts, they've got they've um, got rid of short term limited duration plans and they are a way to help people, more, particularly young people who don't maybe have insurance. It's cheaper than doing an exchange plan under Obamacare and it gives them coverage in, in, in case of an emergency. So, you know, it's really I think the people in the Democratic Party who, who don't, don't seem to understand that giving young people more choice will reduce the rate of the uninsured and reduce health care costs. Yeah, you, you mentioned in your in your article that Americans for Prosperity have weighed in on this and they, they call this the personal option, which I think is a, uh, you know, you can call it the liberty option, too, for that matter. But the freedom uh, option, the freedom option. Absolutely. And and look, I mean, this is a way for you to. You know, to to craft your own insurance policy that fits your own particular needs, which is something that you were able to do um, before Obamacare. Now, was it it was less expensive to do that? Did it give you the comprehensive coverage that everybody said that you absolutely had to have? Not in all cases, but again, for most people, uh, especially younger people, you only really needed health insurance to cover hospitalizations, especially when you're looking at um, the way deductibles increased, right? Because, and Sally, you, you and I have talked about this before, is that not only were premiums increasing after Obamacare, but the deductibles went out of sight. I mean, prior to Obamacare, I think my deductibles on an employer plan were somewhere between three and $500 a year. They're at 3000 now. So much, most of the stuff that I'm spending on my HSAs is covering to the point where I get to the deductibles. And you're right, I'm not 28 years old anymore. <laughs> So it's things happen. Things yeah. happen. Well, no, that's right. I mean, the deductibles. I mean, many people that even, that have that those people that do have exchange plans, the deductible is so high that they can't even afford. You know, they can't afford that. I mean, to get to that level of of deductible is is just beyond for for most sort of average uh, people. And so, you know, it's it's very very um, important to open up to competition and choice and the personal option. Um, whether I mean, I think it's it's a great um, term. And, you know, I mean, Bernie Sanders, the Pied Piper of single payer health care, who just had a hearing um, last week. I mean, I think he's going to I just don't think single payer can move forward um, in in this environment and it won't. And I don't he's never had a bill that actually has come to fruition. But, you know, he they're also the Democrats support the public option, which is that government insurance plan competing against private insurers. So when you look at the polling, only 40 percent of people support the public, that public option, whereas over 60 percent support the idea of a personal option. And if you look up in the, in the, the states that are expanding and going into the public option, Nevada in a couple of years, um, Seattle and Washington State, Cascade Care, the premiums under Cascade Care are much much higher than even the premiums under Obamacare. And the uh, uh, Governor Inslee is saying he's going to have to mandate that the hospitals take cascade care and coverage because, you know, right now it's it's not a win win for them. So when it's very interesting. The personal option in the polling is polling very well, 60 percent versus a public option at 40 percent or in the um, terms of 36% support for Medicare for all, whereas the personal option at 64%. I think Americans are just really fed up with how government is moving into all aspects of our lives um, since the uh, since the inauguration in January of 2021. 20, uh, 20, uh, how much do you think that the COVID response from both administrations play into that too? I mean, 
you had the lockdowns, you had the the force masking, which is still going on. Uh, you know, a friend of mine is um, the lead attorney in that Florida case. I finally got the uh, CDC mask mandate thrown out on the basis I of overstepping uh, jurisdiction. How many people do you think are waking up to the fact that Obamacare really uh, opened the gates for a lot more intrusion into uh, personal choices and, and and maybe started connecting some of those dots, even though maybe it was indirectly, but started connecting some of those dots after watching how the federal government operated during the pan pandemic? Right. Well, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, certainly uh, in my mind, Dr. Fauci way overstepped his mark um, in, in what he was doing. And he still um, one day said, well, I think yeah, we'll get rid of the the mask mandates and you know the next day tomorrow will be saying well we need the mask mandate back and cases are out of control government between the cdc and dr fauci and people um, within the administration have really i think people of the american people have finally come to the realization that you know we we need it's more important that the economy move forward you know people lost their jobs people you know had no income they didn't have savings we people have to get back to work and now we're finding that young people don't want to go back to work i mean you know what's better than staying home you know having your starbucks coffee going to the gym you know your life is much more um flexible when you're not going to the office but there's something to be said for going to the office and i think you know covid really turned the tables on a lot of things and i'm hoping that we're over the mask mandate uh you know if people you know i don't believe in in mandating that people get vaccinated i think people should be smart enough to get vaccinated yep. but i don't think government should be doing so many of these things well and this is the point that i'm kind of getting at right because obamacare was set up as you know, governance by the experts, right? The federal government was going to take over these insurance marketplaces because they could set the prices because they understood the market and they could ensure that everything was going to operate on on, on, a, on that expert basis, right? And that was actually, I mean, I, there were aspects of Obamacare that were very unpopular, but there was aspects of it that were popular based on the fact that they thought that they, you know, people thought they were getting stiffed by the insurance companies and wanted experts to run this thing because experts knew better than they did. I think one major thing, one major transformation that comes out of this, and to your point in your Newsmax column, is something that Republicans actually should be talking about in this, in this term, is that there is no better substitute uh, for an advocate for your own interest than you yourself. And you can, we just simply cannot set up these structures to cede power to so-called experts who turn out to be incompetent at, at making those types of central command type decisions, as we saw you know, in the pandemic. There's certainly a role for government, right, in pandemic management, but it's when they go far past that, the, the, the actual government role, the legitimate government role, that things end up getting absolutely out, out of whack and you know with education with kids being uh locked out of classrooms and with masks on when, when it, there was no need for it all of this really undermines the whole argument be under um, obamacare under medicare for all which is that the experts can deal with these issues they simply can't and i think that that's one key point in that in it certainly comes across in your column it's also a key point that republicans really need to um really need to press i think in the midterm elections well i mean as you know i'm canadian i grew up under single payer and i worked at the fraser institute uh back in the late 80s when we developed waiting your turn a guide to waiting list this last year 2021 the waiting times from seeing a primary care doctor treatment by a specialist 25.6 weeks that's almost half a year people in this country don't know what that means when you can't get a doctor there aren't enough doctors care is rationed so if you're older you're not going to get access um, to the doctor and it's not free i mean bernie sanders gets up on the stumps of canadians have the best health care and it's free the average family pays f over fifteen thousand dollars a year for in hidden taxes for a plan where they can't get a doctor and under the under the pandemic it got even worse because the hospitals are owned by by the government they're run by the provincial governments and people couldn't couldn't get care so you're going to see you know deaths from cancer and things and heart issues much higher and so you know look in california ab 1400 finally was um cut was removed and wasn't voted on on january 31st but the legislative analyst office said 552 billion dollars a year our state budget's only 286 
billion a year and what people are going to put up with these long waits and not and the best and brightest kids won't go into medicine it'll be a total disaster well i i don't know if you saw the i'm sure you did because you're you really tapped into this stuff but um the uh, was it a former director of the national health service in the united kingdom was was jeremy hunt jeremy hunt yes indeed so yeah i, I how did i know that you'd be you, you, you'd be all, already already for this. But he was talking about how much of the hype around NHS is just simply nonsense, how bad the wait times are, how bad the response times are, and the fact that he simply couldn't work in that system any longer. That is, I think, we're going to start seeing more of this, at least I hope we're going to start seeing more of this as a wake-up call to our, our own drift into that type of um, central plan system. And under in the under the NHS in the UK, there are over six million people today waiting um, to get an appointment with a doctor, and there's a doctor shortage. And um, even in the UK, you know, the private healthcare can run parallel to the government national health service. Canada doesn't allow that. Bernie Sanders' plan wouldn't allow that. Um, even the Brit, the Brits, the NHS people, and the docs are saying there could be 13 million people on a waiting list by this fall because people are quitting medicine. Doctors are quitting medicine. And the fact that, um, you know, the, the, there just aren't enough hospitals and facilities to treat all of these people. So Jeremy Hunt was totally right. I'm glad he came out and, and said these things. The Cleveland Clinic is opening a huge clinic um, near where the American Embassy in London was. So they can try to, they're, they're hoping that they'll be able to, you know, treat more people and get people off those waiting lists. So the private option in the UK is expanding significantly because people were so fed up with the long waits. And if it's your health, you're concerned. If you think you have cancer, you don't want to be told you have to wait 11 months before you can get an MRI. Well, Sally Pipes, it's always great talking with you. People should go over to Newsmax to take a look at that uh, article, but they should also go to the Pacific Research Institute to find out more. That's pacificresearch.org, pacificresearch.org. They got a new book release that's out now, Saving California. Uh, so find out more about that at pacificresearch.org. And of course, you can go to uh, Sally's uh, uh, Twitter account uh, at Sally Pipes in order to find out the latest and greatest from the Pacific Research Institute and uh, Americans for Prosperity, which she uh, often uh, interacts with and all sorts of different great stuff on her Twitter feed. Sally, thank you so much for being with us. Great talking with you again. Great talking with you and I hope we'll talk again soon, Ed. Good luck with your show. Well, thank you very much. I hope we talk again soon. Stay tuned for more from the Ed Morrissey Show coming right up. Hey folks, this is Ed Morrissey here. I wanted to say thank you for watching or listening to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. If you like what you watch or see, please be sure to subscribe to the channel on which you're watching or, or listening to this, either YouTube or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Rumble, Town Hall Media Player. Be sure to subscribe at any and all of those places so that you can find out when the next Ed Morrissey Show podcast will be dropping. Thanks again and have a great week.